plenty of football managers divide opinion. Some people think that Pep Guardiola is the greatest manager of all time. Others think that he's always had it too easy in terms of the talent and budget at his disposal. Unai Emery is a miracle worker to some and a Europa League merchant to others. Within my particular friendship group, it is Graham Potter who seems to be the subject of endless debate as to how impressive his work at Brighton to date has actually been. It is just part and parcel of the job. Managers are the figureheads of football clubs, and football is an incredibly polarising sport. But few managers, if any, have ever divided a nation quite like Gareth Southgate does in England. Despite being, statistically, by almost any metric, the second most successful England manager of all time, Southgate receives about as much criticism and vitriol from some England fans as Steve McLaren did a man who led England into only one tournament, and failed to qualify for that tournament, with this group of players. I have made a video about Gareth Southgate in the past, when he was last under real pressure towards the back end of 2020, and lots of people were saying that England had to sack Southgate before the Euros if they wanted to do anything at that tournament. I have wanted to make a follow-up video to that one for a while now, but following England's humbling at the hands of a ruthless Hungary team who inflicted upon the three lines their worst home defeat in almost 100 years, leading to an avalanche of claims and counterclaims being made about the current England boss, and a massive online hysteria, not least from people with whom I share a platform with on YouTube, who routinely appear to be either performatively stupid and incendiary to try and drive engagement, or who are perhaps genuinely just like that and have found a platform where that kind of behaviour is encouraged, I decided to fast track this video and just make it now. Basically, I want to assess some of the major claims that are made about Southgate, such as that he plays boring football, he's wasting the best England team in 20 years, and he just got lucky with England's draws in 2018, and in 2021, among many others of course, and hopefully, by the end of this video, it will be easier to determine whether Gareth Southgate is the spawn of Satan himself, or a messiah who has been sent down from high above and bestowed upon us to guide the three lines to glory at the 2022 World Cup. Because, you know, it must be one of those two. Right? Right? The first point that I want to address, purely because it is the one that irritates me the most, and as you will all know, I am a man who is fueled primarily by rage and contempt, as well as Weetabix of course, is that Gareth Southgate is wasting either a squad that is packed full of world-class players, England's best team in 20 years, or, in many cases, if not most, both of the above. I saw this a lot following the Hungary game, including in my own Twitter mentions, and it was stated as though it were received wisdom. Yep, this is the best England team for 20 years, maybe ever, and everyone knows that. And therefore, reaching the semi-finals of the World Cup and the final of the Euros is just par for the course. An underachievement, if anything, this group of players should be winning both. Now, Aside from the fact that the team that reached the semi-finals of the World Cup in Russia four years ago was obviously rather different from the current group, Deli Ali, Jesse Lingard, and Ashley Young all started that semi against Croatia for a start, I will just let that slide since we will come to past performance later on and focus on the current squad for now, which I think is considerably stronger than the group that Gareth Southgate inherited in 2016, and the group that he took to the World Cup in Russia in 2018. First things first, I should say that I am a huge admirer of this England squad, which is packed full of players who I find far more likeable than any previous England squad just for a start, but also no lack of talent. I frequently find myself defending England players against what I consider to be undue criticism, whether that be Jordan Pickford or Raheem Sterling, so it is slightly strange now to hear people calling them all world beaters, but it is actually worth going through the England team and squad from top to bottom to assess that claim. In goal, Jordan Pickford has been brilliant for England, despite having had his shaky moments at Everton over the years, 
And whilst he is one of the most maligned England players, I actually feel extremely confident when he is in net for us. Aaron Ramsdale shipping four against Hungary, even if there was very little that he could do about some of those goals, all but guarantees that, if fit, it will be Pickford who starts for England at the World Cup. Having said all of that, Pickford is not world class by almost any definition of the term, and he almost certainly isn't among the 10 best goalkeepers on the planet. At right back, England are very well served, particularly in terms of depth, everyone knows that. At centre-back, Harry Maguire and John Stones have been very good for England at a Euros and a World Cup, but are they world-class? Stones was Manchester City's third-choice centre-back this season and played fewer than half as many Premier League matches as either Ruben Diaz or America Laporte this season, just 14, and the idea that he was all right on the ball but couldn't defend was pretty much commonplace just a few years ago. Maguire has been absolutely lampooned for his performances at Manchester United over the last 12 months, with many people calling for him to be dropped at both club and international level. As backup, you have got Connor Cody, Mark Gay, Fakayo Tamori, Tyrone Mings and Ben White, all decent centre-backs at this stage, but far from being among the best in the world, and only Tamori you would imagine has any chance of cracking England's starting eleven at the World Cup, unless there are injuries to Stones and Maguire. At left back, England have real problems. Shaw was great at the Euros, but has been totally out of sorts this season. Meanwhile, Ben Chilwell has been out since November after rupturing his cruciate ligament. In midfield, Declan Rice seems to be a nailed-on starter, but serves a different purpose for England than he does for West Ham. And then you have got a whole raft of talented central midfielders, but none who would waltz straight into the starting 11s of a plethora of other top-ranked national teams, hence why that position is still so open ahead of the World Cup. On the flanks, and able to play as a number 10, is where England do have genuine strength in depth, with the likes of Mason Mount, Jack Grealish, Phil Foden, Raheem Sterling, Bakayo Saka, Jadon Sancho, Marcus Rashford, and Jared Bowen amongst others. But realistically, you can only play two or three of them, which has been one of Gareth Southgate's biggest selection headaches to date. And up top, Harry Kane is England's talisman and star man, and is undeniably world class. But there is a distinct lack of obvious deputies to him, with Danny Ings, Ollie Watkins, Dominic Calvert-Lewin, and even Patrick Bamford having threatened to take up that mantle at various stages over the last couple of years. And Tammy Abraham, now seemingly the favourite off the back of a fairly prolific season in Syria. I do not want to diminish this England squad in any way. There are lots of very talented and particularly exciting young players within it. I just want to put it in some perspective. The England squad is no better than a handful of other national team squads, whether that be France, Germany, Spain, or Brazil, and there is very little to split it from the squads of, well, let's say Belgium, Argentina, Italy, Portugal, and the Netherlands. I honestly have no idea where this notion that England have the best team on the planet and should be able to go into tournaments and just absolutely pummel everyone has come from, it has never been the case. Aside from anything else, no team does that. En route to winning the 2014 World Cup, Germany drew 2 all with Ghana and needed extra time just to overcome Algeria in the round of 16. Four years earlier, Spain lost their opening game at the 2010 World Cup against Switzerland and didn't win a single knockout game by more than a single goal. Heck, at Euro 2016, Portugal literally finished third in their group, were winless, and only managed to win one game against Wales within 90 minutes. Throughout the entire tournament, beating Poland on penalties in the quarterfinals, and then at Euro 2020, Italy only won one knockout game within normal time, they were fortunate to get past Austria in the round of 16, and they won both the semis and the final in a penalty shootout. What I'm trying to say is, international football is really hard. The small nations have become much more competitive, they are incredibly organised and tough to break down, and the margins are so tight that 
a single mistake or piece of magic from either side is highly likely to dictate the outcome of a game. Virtually no team has ever steamrolled all the way through a World Cup. Maybe Brazil in 1970, but I can assure you that this England team is not the Brazil 1970 team. And anyone who thinks otherwise is suffering from a degree of delusion that I would imagine could actually be diagnosed, medically speaking, as they have clearly lost all in any sense of reality. Forget 1970 Brazil though, this England team isn't even 2004, 2006 or 2010 England quality, on paper at least. This may very well be the best England team in 20 years in terms of their performances at tournaments, but it certainly isn't the best on paper, which would seem, counterintuitively to the argument that is often made, if anything, to pay compliment to the work of Gareth Southgate and his team, and to suggest that they have actually overachieved at both Euro 2020 and at the 2018 World Cup. Compare this England team with the team of the mid-2000s. In goal, I would say, there is not all that much to split Jordan Pickford and David James. At right back, England certainly have better depth now, but Gary Neville was as consistent and defensively savvy as anyone in the current squad. At centre-back, there is no comparison. John Terry and Rio Ferdinand were two of the best centre-backs in the world, as was Sol Campbell. Meanwhile, you had the likes of Jamie Carragher, Ledley King, and Jonathan Woodgate waiting in the wings. All six of those players were brilliant centre-backs, and three were undeniably world-class. It is just chalk and cheese compared to the current crop. A left-back, England had, for most of that time, the best left-back in the world in the form of Ashley Cole, with Wayne Bridge and, later, Leighton Baines serving as his deputies, both of whom made the PFA Team of the Year, as did Wes Brown, as a matter of fact, who I didn't even list among England's vast array of centre-backs at the time. In midfield, Frank Lampard, Steven Gerrard, Paul Scholes, David Beckham, Owen Hargreaves, Michael Carrick, Joe Cole and Nicky Butt were all, well, let's just say decent players who had pretty decent careers. And I would suggest offered slightly more quality and depth than England's current midfield options. And up top, you had Wayne Rooney and Michael Owen. Similar to now, there wasn't an obvious deputy to those two, but at the very least, there was two of them rather than one. No one can convince me that the current England team is better, on paper, than that team, which did actually have world-class players in every position other than in net, whereas England now have a goalkeeper, two centre-backs, a left-back, and at the very least one midfielder, which I would also point out is half of a starting 11 that are far from being world-class. Of course, with that outstanding squad, England won Euro 2004 and the 2006 World Cup, hence why expectations on this currently inferior group of players are so high. Oh, oh no. Hang on. That, that's right, isn't it? They, they went out in the quarterfinals of both of those tournaments to Portugal on penalties, followed by failing to even qualify for Euro 2008, getting mullered by Germany after scraping through the group stage at the 2010 World Cup, another quarter-final defeat on penalties at Euro 2012, finishing bottom of a group that was topped by Costa Rica at the 2014 World Cup, and then getting knocked out of Euro 2016 by a country with the same sized population as Coventry. Remind me, why are expectations so high again? What frequently follows any argument about Southgate wasting a squad of clear Ballon d'Or winners is that he is tactically inept, he plays boring football, or, again, I should stress, both of the above. I do not believe that Gareth Southgate is a tactical genius by any means, nor do I believe that that is actually pivotal to being successful in international management where you have so little time with your players on the training ground, and man management and motivation seem to me to be as important as anything else. It's worth taking that claim on face value though, and probably the biggest critique of Southgate's management is that he is too negative. We've got all of these wonderful attacking players like Grealish, Foden, Sterling and Kane, yet we play with a back five and two midfield setters. Or so the argument goes. For a long time, this is an argument that 
I had a lot of sympathy for, and I still do, to a certain extent. England are, at their best, when they're on the front foot. I think we saw that even, away at Germany during this disappointing Nations League break, and our best players are forward players. But saying, well, our best players are forward, so therefore we should play a load of them, is rather simplistic, to put it mildly. By the same token, because our defenders aren't as strong as our forwards, or as strong as they have been for most of the past few decades, they also need a bit more help. After all, Southgate doesn't play a back five because he is ideologically wedded to that system, it isn't how he set up with England's under-21s, and it isn't how he played at Middlesbrough, at least as far as I can recall. He did it because he felt that his centre-backs were too exposed against decent opposition when they were just in a two. He has moved away from that back three or five multiple times, mostly in friendly and Nations League fixtures, and reverted to a back four. And typically, it has resulted in poorer performances, more goals being conceded, and not even more goals being scored. What's more, a back three or five, depending upon how you define it, doesn't even necessarily have to be negative at all. If you play with three centre-backs where one of them is progressive on the ball, and your two wing-backs are, let's say, Trent Alexander-Arnold and Ben Chilwell, that is more attacking than most back fours. Besides, nowadays, in a lot of back fours, you will find the fullbacks push up so far whenever a team is in possession that they function effectively as wingers. Meanwhile, the midfield pivot drops in between the two centre-backs to form an effective back three regardless. So, I don't think the formation itself has to be negative at all, it just depends upon the personnel and the instructions that come with it. England also don't actually play with a classic pivot or defensive midfielder at all. Declan Rice, Calvin Phillips and Jordan Henderson are all frequently described as being midfield setters for England, even James Ward-Prowse, but that isn't actually the role that they play for their clubs. None of them are akin to a Fabinho or Fernandinho, whose roles are almost entirely destructive. I actually think that this is the role that Declan Rice should be playing for England, rather than being more progressive as he is for West Ham, but it is difficult to implement that in the limited amount of time Southgate has with his squad, hence why I think that will most likely only happen if, or most likely when, Declan Rice leaves West Ham, joins a Champions League team, and they turn him into exactly that type of player. So, negative? Eh, maybe. Maybe a little bit. No more negative than France under Deschamps, who have a far better squad than England, and certainly no more negative than Portugal under Fernando Santos, who have a squad of similar talent, I would suggest. In the vast majority of games that England play in, they are the more adventurous, attacking, and progressive team. So, whilst I do still think that England could be a bit more bold, and Southgate might have to be a bit more bold, particularly against teams who park the bus against England, I don't think that a radical change of intent is required. The nuance of this gets lost in the mad panic following defeat, and the wild jubilation following a win, but the reality for England is that most teams will sit in deep, try to remain compact, and prevent England from scoring goals against them. As is wise, because England, as we have already established, have the attacking players to pick off the vast majority of national teams if they do anything else. That means that if England manage to unpick that lock and score the first goal, forcing the opposition to open up a little bit more and attack themselves, they can often pick them off for fun as those gaps open up. That is why we have seen results like England beating Iceland 4-0, Hungary 4-0, Ukraine 4-0 and Albania 5-0 in recent years, all of whom are actually fairly decent and competitive teams. There was also the 10-0 win against San Marino, of course, though that one is slightly different. But if England fail to score that first goal, they can remain compact and organise against England and grow in confidence whilst England themselves begin to get more frustrated and start to make more mistakes. To be clear, this is not in any way unique to England. It is the case for every team that is expected to win most of their games, 
And the reason why Manchester City and Liverpool are the two best teams in the Premier League is because they are so good at moving the ball at pace to unlock defences and score that first goal, and at keeping a cool head, remaining methodical, and not making any rash decisions when they can't find that opening, even in the latter stages of a match. England can get better at that, there is no doubt. And that is part of Southgate and his coaching team's job to instill that in his players. And certainly to find ways of scoring goals when opponents are proving to be a really tough nut to crack. Historically, they actually did a very good job at doing just that. Most notably at the 2018 World Cup, when England were outstanding, and I mean among the best teams that I have ever seen, when it came to set-piece routines. And that was how they were able to score the first goal in a lot of crucial games. Given the importance of that first goal, which is often created by moving the ball quickly and understanding between forward players or a moment of magic, having your best players, who have played together often out on the pitch, is obviously very important. I am not making any excuses for England losing 4-0 at home to Hungary because the result itself is inexcusable. But I don't think that it is any coincidence that when England fielded their strongest 11 against Hungary, they beat them 4-0 away from home and drew one all with them at Wembley Stadium in the World Cup qualifiers. This week, Southgate fielded a team that had never played together before, a few players making only their first or second starts, and just generally a very young team. They should still, and very nearly did, score the opening goal in the first 10 minutes, but then Hungary scored a sucker punch, and it has to be said that the ruthlessness of Hungary's finishing was absolutely out of this world. You could play that game over a hundred times again, and I highly doubt that they would finish every one of those four chances again, but huge credit to them. I don't think that a full-strength England team, though, if they were to meet Hungary at the World Cup Finals, which they can't because Hungary finished fourth in the qualifying group that England won, nine points behind Gareth Southgate's side, I think that a full-strength England team would finish one of those early chances, and then it is a very, very different game. I'm not even going to touch upon the end-of-season fatigue issue or the timing of these games because there will already be those of you who are listening to this and perhaps watching, and think that I am making excuses, which I promise you, I am not. But context is important, especially when people are trying to use this international break as tracing paper, which they can place perfectly over the upcoming World Cup, and make predictions on that basis as to how England will play and what they will achieve. These exact same arguments were made before Euro 2020, which it is worth reminding ourselves, was only actually a year ago. People said that England would go out in the group stage, that they would lose to the first decent side that they faced, and, least coherently of all, because they were so woke and decided to take the knee, they would surrender and lose every game. Of course, none of those things happened. England comfortably topped their group, they beat Germany, Ukraine, and Denmark, and... Only the cruel fate of penalties could deny them of a first ever Euros crown in the final. I'm not saying that the same predictions will fall just as flat on their arse of the upcoming World Cup. I am not in possession of a crystal ball. But it is just worth bearing that in mind. Since I have sort of just touched upon it, I ought to very quickly address the idea that England got very lucky or easy draws at the 2018 World Cup and at Euro 2020. At the 2018 World Cup, it is basically true. England had a pretty favourable group featuring two teams who you would expect them to beat, and Belgium, and if Gareth Southgate had been offered Colombia and Sweden as round of 16 and quarterfinal opponents, I'm sure that he would have said yes. Of course, none of that changes the fact that England had literally being knocked out by Iceland at the most recent major tournaments, meaning that Colombia and Sweden certainly could not be considered as mere cannon fodder, given that both of them actually topped their groups at the World Cup, but they were nonetheless reasonably favourable ties. At the Euros, I actually think England had a pretty awkward group up against Croatia, Scotland and the Czech Republic, which they dealt with very well. No right-minded person could tell me that 
A round of 16 tie with Germany, who had just battered Portugal 5-2, is an easy game. Ukraine, sure, though England did make them look a lot worse than they were, and indeed are, and Denmark, I think, are a really good team, but as a semi-final, admittedly, you could do a lot worse. So, basically, in terms of favourable draws, yeah, sort of. Not always, but, but sure. That doesn't really change the fact that you still have to beat them, and before Gareth Southgate, England had often struggled to do that when it mattered most. And the idea that he bottles it, therefore, in those games, is pretty demonstrably untrue. Also, and just as a side note, I am forever hearing people say that Southgate got lucky because England only beat Colombia on penalties in the round of 16 stage of the 2018 World Cup. But I very rarely hear the same argument made about Italy in the Euro 2020 final or about how unlucky England and Southgate were in that instance. In fact, when you hear people talk about the Euro 2020 final, you could quite easily be fooled into thinking that England were battered 4-0, when in fact, they drew one all in 90 minutes, 0-0 in extra time, and lost after failing to convert three penalties, whilst Italy only failed to convert two. As I said, it is fine margins in football. Whilst we are on the topic of reasonable criticisms of Gareth Southgate, it is obviously true that his club credentials are modest at best. A three-year stint at Middlesbrough, which culminated in relegation, and three years with the England under-21s, which included a poor Euros performance, is not quite on the same level as Roberto Mancini or Louis van Gaal, for example. That much is obviously true. But England have plenty of experience with managers who had outstanding credentials at club level. Sven Goran Eriksson won a Serie A title at Lazio, the UEFA Cup with Gothenburg, and he took Benfica to a European Cup final. Fabio Capello had won seven league titles with AC Milan, Real Madrid, and Roma, nine if you throw in the two that were later revoked at Juventus, in addition to winning the Champions League and a vast array of other trophies. Even Roy Hodgson had managed both Inter Milan and Liverpool and took Fulham to a Europa League final. But one thing that all three of them had in common, as we have already established, in addition to having excellent club CVs, is that combined, over a period of 14 years, not one of them could achieve what Gareth Southgate has achieved twice in the space of just five years. So, personally, the fact that Gareth Southgate hasn't done much at club level, and maybe Manchester City and Liverpool won't be rushing to appoint him as Guardiola or Klopp's successor, whilst that is true, it doesn't really bother me. What bothers me is how good he is at managing England. And when it has mattered most, to date, the answer, I would argue, is that he has been very good. Certainly better than any of those three, the first two of whom at least, had far superior players at their disposal. History proves that managing at club and international level are two totally different ballgames. The most successful World Cup manager of all time, Helmut Schoen, who won the World Cup in 1974, reached the final in 1966 and the semi-finals in 1970, having won more games at the World Cup finals than any other manager, and having won the Euros in 1972 and reached a further final again in 1976, spent just a single season managing in club football, in which he finished fifth in the Oberliga Sudwest with FC Saarbrücken, who weren't even the best team from Saarbrücken that season, finishing one place behind Saar 05 Saarbrücken. Maybe, as some people claim, Gareth Southgate has reached his ceiling as England boss. Maybe his role was simply to oversee a transition period following that horrific defeat and elimination at the hands of Iceland and the debacle of Big Sam by lifting morale and getting England back on track. He was, after all, initially appointed only on an interim basis. And if that was the case, and if that was his objective, he hasn't just fulfilled it spectacularly, he has gone above and beyond it by an order of many magnitudes reaching England's first World Cup semi-finals since 1990, and first Euros finals since, well, ever, since that is something that no England team and no England manager had ever previously achieved. To my mind, 
that at least earns him a shot at the upcoming World Cup. And the idea that you would sack a manager, who has reached the semi-final and the final of his only two major tournaments, just two games before the next tournament begins, simply because of one bad international break, however bad, compounded by a freak result, well, that seems to me to be absurd. And I would be beyond surprised if that were to happen. If England crash and burn in Qatar, Gareth Southgate will lose his job, either because he will resign or because he will be sacked. That is the way of the world, and three tournaments is a decent innings for most international managers. If England reach the semis or the final, or even get knocked out narrowly despite putting up a valiant effort against another top national team earlier in the knockout stages, he may well keep his job. Because, as we have hopefully established, England are not head and shoulders above every other team on the planet, it is delusional to think otherwise, and it is quite difficult to win the World Cup. If every England manager who didn't win the Euros or the World Cup was a spectacular failure, well, I've got some news for you. That is, all but one of them, and the one exception was helped by some very suspect officiating in favour of the home nation at the 1966 World Cup. I want England to be ambitious, I want England to be exciting, and I want England to win as much as pretty much anyone. But never have England been more ambitious, more exciting, or more successful during my lifetime than they have been under Gareth Southgate. If you still think that he's rubbish and should be sacked, that's cool. It is a game of opinions, and I totally get it. It's not that there is no credence to some of the criticisms of Southgate, but equally, some of them are absurd and Southgate derangement syndrome may well become a registered condition with the NHS before long. Someone tweeted me the other night after that Hungary game, saying that Southgate is the worst manager that England have ever had. And another person sent me this video by this grade A turnip, claiming that the defeat to Hungary was worse than the 2014 World Cup and Euro 2016. My apologies if I offended any turnips there, but really? Gareth Southgate is a worse England manager than Steve McLaren, is that what we're going with? A man who had one job to qualify for Euro 2008 and failed at it. Or Don Revy, who failed to qualify for Euro 76 before quitting as England boss to take a job as manager of the UAE. Or Graham Taylor, whose England team finished bottom of their group at Euro 1992 before failing to qualify for the 1994 World Cup. He's worse than all of them, having qualified for two World Cups and a Euros with consummate ease, reaching the semi-final of one, the final of another, and, well, the next one is still to come. And the Hungary defeat, in a competition that is, as yet, not taken especially seriously by the major nations, who effectively treat it as an experimental warm-up competition for upcoming tournaments, in which England fielded a starting 11, only three of whom will likely actually start for them in the opening game of the 2022 World Cup, was worse than England getting knocked out of a World Cup before they had even played their final group game against Costa Rica, which they also didn't win and who topped their group, and getting knocked out of Euro 2016 by a well-organised chain of frozen food supermarkets. In the words of Roy Keane, Ugh, oh, really? I think not. Like I said, if you think Southgate is useless and England are doomed to failure with him at the helm, that's cool. The dude abides. But let's keep a sense of perspective, if at all possible. Ah, this is England we're talking about, isn't it? Perspective. Who am I kidding? As I tweeted, only one thing is for certain. And that's that if England beat Iran in the opening game of the World Cup, you can bet your bottom dollar that it will be a Christmas number one for Southgate, you're the one, you still turn me on. m and waistcoats will be flying off the shelves and that lookalike bloke will be dancing while someone lights a flare that is lodged up their arse once again. England, 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 England. All right, that's it for today's video. It's just my two pennies worth, as I said. Some of you will disagree and that is fine, but I just wanted to throw that out there rather than trying to put it in however many characters you can put on Twitter these days. Thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it, whether you agree, disagree, or 
hate me to my bones. If that was the case, hit the like button. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And make sure you're subscribed, of course, it goes without saying. And have notifications turned on for HITC Sims. You can also find me on social media, on Twitter or Instagram, via the username at HITC Sims on both, should you wish to do so. Peace.